Welcome to the Russian Rulers History Podcast, Episode 109, The End Game Nears. Last time, we recounted the muddled progress, if you could call it that, where Gorbachev tried to reform both domestic and foreign policy with little success, especially with the economy. Now, before I start, let me apologize for not being on time with this podcast. Life keeps presenting one challenge at a time in front of me, so while I try to keep a regular schedule of podcasts, sometimes it just isn't possible. I will be doing episode 110 in the next week or two, but after that I'll have to take a few weeks off, probably three or four, because I'm traveling. I'm traveling off to Australia, where I'll be teaching some classes in lab testing and in health in both Sydney and Melbourne. So, well, but the good news is I'll have lots of scripts that I'll be able to prepare because, frankly, the trip over there, flight is over 15 hours, so I will have lots of time to put together some scripts. And because remember, we're almost at the end of the Russian rulers segment of the podcast, and we'll be moving on to different events and people from there. So, while I'll be off for a while, there's good news behind it. Anyways, let's get going on this podcast. The challenges facing Gorbachev in 1985 and 86 were immense, especially economically. The Soviet budget was a secret to even the most senior Politburo members. Gorbachev, in his memoirs, claims to have not known what the numbers were until almost the end of his tenure as party head. Now, I find this a bit incredulous and probably just an excuse for not doing anything about it. The military took up 40% of the total budget, which shocked the Politburo members, who were now becoming more and more aware of the true problems facing them because of perestroika and glasnost. Add to that the staggering amount that the Russians were spending on foreign aid. Vietnam was getting 40 billion rubles annually, Cuba, 25 billion, and Syria, 6 billion. No wonder the people had little. Everything was headed out to the military of foreign countries. The subsidies to food producers and other parts of the consumer economy were huge as well. The only logical thing that needed doing was to raise prices and reduce subsidies as well as lowering military expenditure and foreign aid. Unbelievably, Gorbachev and his cohorts in the Politburo, they felt that the social ramifications were greater than the economic issues. The lack of basic understanding of how economies work by supposedly such a learned man as Gorbachev is really hard to understand. With plunging oil prices, things looked desperate. Gorbachev had to reach a peace agreement with the U.S. at all costs. Before he got to do that, he had to deal with internal party politics and get more people on his side. Well, the first person to go was Viktor Grishin, a one-time opponent of Gorbachev. He lost his post as first secretary of the Moscow City Power, of City Party, excuse me, to one Boris Yeltsin in 1985, and the following year he was removed from the Politburo. By the middle of 1986, according to Robert Service in his fantastic book, A History of Modern Russia, quote, two thirds of the province-level party secretaries had not had the same jobs a half decade later. Gorbachev was cleaning house with the belief that this would stimulate the economy and strengthen his position. The problem here was that he had no plan to go forward. He just thought that reform, in whatever way that would happen, would magically improve the situation and make the USSR stronger. As service puts it, quote, the irony was that Gorbachev, in trying to prevent the descent of the system into general crisis, proved instrumental in bringing forward that crisis and destroying the USSR. He goes further on in discussing the issues facing the Soviet Union, quote, The problem was that most party officials refused to recognize the acuteness of the problems faced by the USSR. This was a reflection of their self-interest, but it also derived from their ignorance. And this ignorance was not confined to officialdom. Soviet society had for decades been prevented from acquiring comprehensive knowledge of the country's past and current problems. It is my belief that because of the lack of knowledge from the top on down, 
to the academicians who Gorbachev counted on to help bring him ideas to revive the Soviet economy that led to the downfall of the USSR. I really can't blame this entirely on Gorbachev, as he had good intentions, but the system that Lenin, Stalin, Khrushchev, and to a lesser extent, and Brezhnev left him was a failed one. It was based on concealment, fears, lies, and half-truths, and outright mystical fabrication. Think of it. Gorbachev did not know what the real Soviet budget was until his last year in office. No one really did except a few bureaucrats. All the advice Gorbachev was to get in the coming years was based on faulty assumptions and false hopes based on a system that had nothing to stand on anymore. Leninism, Marxism, at that time was an idealistic hoax, which, whenever things showed its failures, they hid them from view under till the pile of dung in the corner was so big that it can no longer be denied. It was into this that Gorbachev flung himself into. He thought he could clean up the garbage left to him, but by now it was too late. Other leaders may have held off the inevitable for a few more years, maybe decades, but the economic reality of the situation was that the Soviet Union was broke and nothing could save them. Gorbachev knew that the military spending had to be reined in, but he could not justify it until he reached an agreement with Ronald Reagan in the United States. But first, he had to get out of Afghanistan. The Soviet military hierarchy was ready to get out, as they knew that despite its armament and numerical superiority, they could no longer win this war. In 1987, the decision was made for what they thought would be an immediate withdrawal. The problem was how to get their soldiers out safely. It would start in January of 1987 and take 13 months to complete. In the midst of this, Gorbachev finally got the weapons agreement he wanted, although not a comprehensive one, when he and U.S. President Reagan signed the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty in December of 1987. Things were finally starting to warm up between the two leaders. Now, an event occurred that, had it happened in almost any other country, nothing much would have come out of it. In May of 1987, an 18-year-old, Matthias Rust, landed his single-engine Reams Cessna F-172P in Red Square, which caused an uproar within the Soviet military and the Politburo. Gorbachev, though, saw it as an opportunity to get rid of some of the more conservative and meddlesome military leaders, with the first being the Minister of Defense, Marshal Sergei Sokolov. This was the opening that Gorbachev needed to open up the military. He then publicly admitted that the Soviets had over 27,000 tanks and 3.5 million soldiers ready for battle in Europe. Now, and unbelievably, this ruined or really weakened any bargaining positions that the Soviet Union could take. But it seems like that's exactly what Gorbachev wanted. Shevardnadze began to exert more influence with Gorbachev in foreign affairs. Gradually, it was becoming more and more apparent to the Warsaw Pact countries that something was up and they were not going to like it. But before we could pull off his plans for his Soviet allies, he had to take care of some domestic policies and the way that the people and the apparatchiks needed to think. As Zubok reports in his book, called The Failed Empire, quote, In the summer of 1987, Gorbachev revealed his intentions to a narrow circle, including Yakolev and Cherneyev. He wanted to overhaul the whole system from economy to mentality. Cherneyev jubilantly recorded Gorbachev's words, quote, I would go very far. When we look back at fulcrum points of history, days that changed the direction of world history, this was one of them. Gorbachev had made it known that everything would change. As Cherneyev further recalled, quote, to achieve a success in foreign policy, we had to depose myths and dogmas of the confrontational ideology. And this had an impact 
through mentality of the general secretary and the reformist mass media of the entire intellectual environment of the society. But then we have to ask, why did Gorbachev tell Robert Mugabe, the head of Zimbabwe in 1987, that, quote, an increasing pressure had to be brought to bear upon Western countries? And then again, he demanded, Reagan denounced the Star Wars program or he wouldn't sign the INF Treaty. His vacillation back and forth from reform to changing to doing the same old stuff shows us that he was still not sold on the decision he was about to make. Now, back to Zubok's book, where he lays the groundwork for what was going to happen between 1988 and 1991. As he puts it, quote, The conservatives, the modernizers, and the military realized that the Soviet Union could ill afford its commitments in Central Europe, Afghanistan, and all over the world. And they advocated cautious retrenchment to postpone the crumbling of the Soviet sphere of influence. In contrast, Gorbachev and the New Thinkers began to proclaim a policy of non-interference in Central Europe. Soon, they would be leaving Soviet allies completely to their own devices. Still, the Politburo majority, the KGB, and the military did not imagine that Gorbachev would, was prepared to bring the Cold War to an end at the cost of the destruction of the Soviet external empire in Central Europe and fatal instability in the Soviet Union itself. Now, what was to occur between 1988 and 91 was astonishing. When we think of the collapse of some of the great empires and civilizations of the past, we think of a slow dissolution, decades or centuries of gradual decline. But when we talk of the dissolution of the Soviet Union, we see a true anomaly a country that fell apart in three short years. Yes, we can make the case that it was falling apart the minute it was formed, but the USSR did not have to collapse the way it did. Had Gorbachev or his advisors had a clear plan, then things likely would have turned out differently. Before we go on with the events that led to the dissolution of the Soviet Union, let me come clear on my opinion of the coming events. I truly believe that had Gorbachev been of a strong will and was a competent leader, the Soviet Union would have become more like today's Chinese capitalist society with layers of socialism. Now, understand, I'm not endorsing the Chinese model as there's glaring weaknesses in it. I do see their system as a more stable one and their tr transition to a market economy than what happened to the USSR. One of the great difficulties I have with covering the collapse of the Soviet Union is how close it is to today. History is best served when there is ample time for things to have, you know, people smarter than me debating the issues. Remember, the dissolution happened only 21 years ago, and that many of the participants, including Gorbachev himself, are still alive. Because of this, I'm going to try to limit my opinions from here on try to be as objective as possible, but there are times when subjective judgment is called for. First off, we have to reiterate that the Soviet Union was in a remarkably bad situation domestically and internationally. The war in Afghanistan had been going badly, both in the field and in the court of public opinion. Eastern Europe was in turmoil as the communist leaders were under increasing pressure to bolster their economy amidst the call for greater freedoms. Still, there was hope as the policy of detente seemed to be gaining traction. Both the conservatives and the reform-minded members of the Politburo knew that the military had to be reined in and the arms race needed to be halted for any economic recovery to occur. As Gorbachev told the Politburo that the race will be, quote, beyond our capabilities and we will lose it because we are at the limit of our capabilities. Moreover, we can expect that Japan and the FRG could very soon join the American potential. If the new round begins, the pressure on our economy will be unbelievable. Before we blame everything that was to come solely on Gorbachev, the blame needs to be kind of parceled out to others as well. As noted by Zubok, the Soviet Union, with the complete approval of Gorbachev 
and Shevard Nadze continued to pour billions of dollars into supplying military equipment to Cuba, Syria, Ethiopia, Vietnam, and other client countries during 1989, 1990, and even part of 1991 when Soviet coffers were already almost empty. There were few, if any, complaints from the members of the Politburo, even though they knew that the era of retaliation was all but buried. They kept confirming whatever Gorbachev asked, which means they're just as culpable in the collapse as he is. In March 1988, Gorbachev began the radical reforms that would accelerate the descent into oblivion when he rejected the Andropov conservative reform, which may have actually worked out had it been continued. Finally, members of the Central Committee and Politburo began to rumble about things. KGB Chairman Viktor Cherbakov was warning Gorbachev that his proposed review and retelling of Soviet history would be disastrous. Igor Likachev warned that the country was on the verge of collapse when he said, quote, arguably, we will muddle through. But there are socialist countries, the world communist movement. What about them? History has become politics, and when we deal with it, we should think not only about the past, but also about the future. Anatoly Chernev, in May of 1989, was far more gloomy when he wrote, quote, Inside me depression and alarm are growing. The sense of crisis of the Gorbachev idea. He is prepared to go far. But what does that mean? His favorite catchword is unpredictability. But no, most likely, we will come to a collapse of the state and something like chaos. Many discuss Gorbachev's personality when talking about the puzzling decisions he made. One observation is that he was very self-assured to an extreme level. Secondly, and one attribute that makes sense is his naivete. His assistant, Georgi Shaknazarov, opinioned that Gorbachev's weakness was his, quote, naive belief in his colleagues' common sense. Dmitry Furman opinioned that Gorbachev's version of the truth was self-evident and that people would grasp it. And in the same way, Luther probably thought that his truths were so obvious that he could easily convince the Pope of them. Many of his colleagues, talking about Gorbachev in hindsight, believed his personality issues were real hindrances and steering the country on the right path. Ar Ligachev argued that Gorbachev, quote, did not have in his character a room for understanding. It could be said that Gorbachev, unlike Brezhnev, did not care to listen to others. He was in some instances more like Stalin and Khrushchev in his self-assessment than even his mentor Andropov. He was so sure that his way was the only way that no other path was even looked at. Now let's look at what the Politburo was like at this time. And according to Robert Service, it was basically virtually a Slavic men's club. Edward Shevardnadze was the only non-Slav in the ruling group. This exclusion of other nationalities served as a rallying point among anti-Soviet and pro-nationalist leaders within the other countries and the Soviet Union. The problem began with Kazakhstan, where the people in Alma-Ata violently protested the appointment of the Russian Gennady Kolbin to replace a Brezhnev ally, Don Mukhmadid Kuneyev. This was followed by protests in Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. More and more inter-ethnic rivalries long subdued by the likes of Stalin, Khrushchev, and Brezhnev, were unleashed. Armenians and Azaris in Azerbaijan battled each other, and many in countries where Russians had been inserted over the years began to see threats from the locals. There was a smoldering hatred of the forced russification that was imposed on the people over the years from the time of the Tsars through the communist era. Tumult was brewing and aside from the occasional military intervention, 
Gorbachev did little to quell things. Glasnost began to permeate the atmosphere throughout the Soviet Union, especially in Moscow, where party chief Boris Yeltsin was calling for more radical reforms than Gorbachev was coming up with. On the opposite side was Ligachev, who began to oppose everything that Gorbachev was asking for. Despite all the pressure Ligachev was putting on him, Mikhail Sergeyevich would not back down. Gorbachev began to make plans to change the dominance of the Communist Party and turn the Soviet Union into a socialist-democratic duality. In order to pull this off, he had to move people around, especially Ligachev. He replaced him as the person in charge of ideology with Vadim Medvedev. Yakolev was moved up to represent the party in international affairs, which meant that Andrei Gromyko, the longtime Soviet face to the outside world, was put to pasture, so to say. But all this movement within the party was all for naught, as Gorbachev had effectively neutered the party with the call for multi-party elections. You might ask yourself, what the hell was he thinking? He was the head of the Communist Party, and he just made it powerless. But here's where we have to make a subjective judgment based on the facts, his memoirs, and his associates' comments. From what I've gathered, he honestly, but naively, believed that when the election votes were counted, the people would select the Communists, because, frankly, their system was the best, and everyone knew it. As Robert Service puts it in his book, quote, It is mysterious how Gorbachev persuaded himself that his version of communism would emerge in a strengthened condition. The main explanation seems to be that he and Foreign Minister Shevardnadze simply overestimated the inherent attractiveness of their ideas. He goes on further to state, in a manner so like Service, you just will love this book, when he spoke about Gorbachev, quote, he was Russia's holy fool, and like the holy fool, he did not know it. We are now in the year 1989, and the state budget was so vastly out of balance, it makes the Greek budget crisis look like a simple checking account overdraft. Spending was still out of control, as it had been under Brezhnev, but with the massive decline in vodka tax revenue and the plummeting fuel prices, they were again pretty much flat broke. By now, fully two-thirds of the expenditure on agriculture was on imports. They were still supplying their eastern allies with subsidized fuel, which were below the rock-bottom prices in the world market. And then the environment. The environment of Russia. The ecology of the land surrounding like Lake Baikal, the Caspian Sea, and the Volga River were poisoned beyond belief. Gorbachev's policy of openness about the problems and his solutions, like the need to raise prices because hoarding was uh, going on everywhere, and that further exacerbated market problems. He made dubious choices in the people he put into important positions. Remember Ligachev? Well, Instead of being the head of party ideology, he moved him to the position of the head of agricultural affairs, with the thought that th this would make him less of a threat to Gorbachev's power. Only problem was, as Service puts it, it's like trusting the fox to guard the hen house. Likachev was completely against reform, so nothing was done to improve agricultural output. The economy was at a breaking point when another natural disaster struck, and that was the massive earthquake and the subsequent triad, a relief effort, that needed to be undertaken in Armenia. Over 25,000 people perished in December 8th of 1988 in that quake. Gorbachev wanted to desperately help the people, but they had nothing. When Mikhail Sergeyevich and his wife Riza found out, when they arrived in Armenia, that the people were more upset with the government corruption than their plight after the earthquake. His economic plans, which had promised improvement in the consumer arena, were failing miserably. Meat rationing was increasing, sugar was in short supply, and medicines, free medicine, long a given, were not available. Housing was still scarce, and the world was becoming aware of the crisis.
Interestingly enough, for the first time, so was the Politburo. They had buried their collective heads in the sand, but now the conditions blew that sand away, and they were staring at a bleak situation. There were two actions that could have been taken at that time to help with the crisis. First was to slow down the reforms, become more conservative and more thoughtful in the ramifications of your actions, or you could simply increase the speed and the radicalness of the reforms. Gorbachev took the out-of-control option, boost up the reforms to an insane level, and then we'll see if that does the trick. He proposed that peasants can begin to take land to till on for their own. They could take them from the coal costs through a family contract. Lots of reformist legislation was coming out of Moscow like crazy. But things were so chaotic that the rules were only being followed if it served the local apparatchik's purposes. It got to the point that some of the local authorities resorted to sabotage. Going back to Robert's service book, he writes, quote, For example, the Leningrad city administration gave orders to withdraw sausages from the fridges in its warehouses and bury them in a specially dug trench on the city's outskirts. These were the politics of criminal provocation. Life without beef and chicken was bad enough for ordinary citizens. Without sausages, it became intolerable, and Gorbachev got the blame. Join me next time as we recount the final days of the Soviet Union and the rise of a new leader, Boris Yeltsin. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Don't forget to head over to the new website, www.russianrulershistory.com, where you can read about a new series I'm doing, where I choose the 10 worst and the 10 best rulers in Russian and Soviet history. We've already got some controversy at my, uh, I believe, number 10 pick for who's best. So, you know, go over there, check it out, see what you think. Of course, you're all welcome to visit the face group, Facebook group at Russian Rulers History Podcast, where you can join the nearly 500 members who have interesting discussions and share lots of information on Russian history. So now, as always, Das Vidanya, Ispasiba Bolshoya.